Holy Hackington! Oh my gosh, we finished Dr. Hugh. Welcome, one and all, to, to the Doctor Who review. Well, we've got a few We're more. We're never we've... doing this ever again. No, we've got a, we've got a, last. we've got a few more yet, but. Enjoy it whilst it lasts, for oh. this is the last, what? What are you talking about? Welcome to Doherty Who, Doherty Review, Pete Doherty Who. I'm Chris. Do you know what? This is the last episode. No, it isn't. There's going to be a couple of more. Of the current run. Oh, for God's sake. So I think you deserve to know my name by now. <gasps> I've definitely not said it throughout the whole series. Oh, my series. God. So I'm Chris. And I am Mrs. Chris. And together we are <laughs> part of it. <laughs> what? what? <laughs> the power of the Doctor. <laughs> the last episode of the Chris Chibnall era of the show. The final episode with Jodie Whittaker as the Doctor, the thirteenth Doctor, and a BBC centenary special event. Um, celebrate hundred years of the BBC. It's also one of the first specials in a long while to be properly feature length. This is 87 minutes long. We also watched it on the uh, on Doctor Who's 60th birthday without realising. Yep, yeah, in the morning of uh, Thursday the 23rd of November 2023 is when we watched this. We're recording it now, this video on the 24th of November. The timing is beautiful because tomorrow we get the next episode of the show. Uh, the, um, the Star Beast. Are you happy? Yeah, it's pretty cool, right? Christopher really wanted to get this finished before. We... Well, that was the thing. So, so those who haven't realised... We'll talk more about this in an upcoming video. But those who don't know, um, we started this in 2018. Like, spring of 2018. And we started putting videos out early summer of 2018. And we haven't just continuously watched Doctor Who since then. But it's basically been like, oh, we're following this. And we're also watching Doctor Who. Yeah. It's been sort of an on-off marathon for five years. Sometimes off because we just sort of fancied a break. Sometimes off because we were away. Like, early on in it, we buggered off to get married in a different country. So that definitely put a kibosh on things. Um, Sometimes we didn't watch it because uh, Mrs. Chris pulled a face. <laughs> yeah, that's, which is hilarious because who started the marathon? Oh, me. Yeah, there we go. Um, back in 2018, we just marathoned <clears throat> the MCU uh, up until Infinity War. For the second time, I'm sure. No, no, it was the first time we'd marathoned it. In fact, it's the only time we'd marathoned oh, really? it. Yeah, we marathoned the MCU and we timed it so that we finished it the week Infinity War came out and Black Panther was still in theatres. So we watched... Uh, what's the one before Black Panther? Uh, we watched Thor Ragnarok. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and then we went to see Black Panther uh, still on showing yeah. in the afternoon yeah. and watched Infinity War in the evening. It is. So we timed it beautifully. We had a great time. And we came on that marathon with you going, oh my God, let's do another marathon or something. And if I remember rightly, the first one we did after that... Sorry, the strange noise is me frogging. That's <laughs> right. The first one we did after that was League of Gentlemen. Because you were like, come on, let's do it. Then we did Mighty Boosh, because we did the whole thing. We did Mighty Boosh, we did series one, two, live show, three, second live show, and then we finished it with the Journey of the Child Men documentary. I feel like we need to rewatch that. Uh, no, because at the time you said, we should do Red Dwarf, because I've never actually seen all of it. So that'll be the next one, <laughs> generally, we end up doing. No, we've watched Red Dwarf. Not the entirety. Yeah, we have. No, we didn't do we Dave. Did. We didn't do Dave. And there's been, like, three series since... We did watch since... the whole thing. That was currently out. Mm, well, we got, genuinely did. Okay, fine. We've got an excuse to do it again. Um, I think we said we'd do like a shorter one, didn't we? I think we suggested like Evil Dead and Ash vs Evil Dead, Buffy. for example. Maybe Buffy and Angel. We should. Do, yeah. Again, not as a video series. Don't worry, folks. Not going to buy your stuff just for us. But um, as as it approached summer of this year, of this recording, twenty twenty three. So about ten months ago for you lot. Um, I was like, we really need to get a shift on with this. We are mid Capaldi. The 60th anniversary is out later this year. Let's time it. Let's just get it done. And I've got to say, even when we had our little sort of kind of like, oh, God, we're not enjoying this as much, or, oh, it's feeling a bit like a job now. 
I think once we realised we'd hit a certain point, that momentum kicks in then of like, oh my god, we've got to do, we've got to do this. Let's get it done. Let's get it done. Um, to the point where I've got to say, we'll talk about the whole thing, but in terms of like this last batch, I've had a really good time the last couple of weeks. Mm. In the last couple of weeks, we've done season twelve, um, Revolution of the Daleks, Flux, and these three specials in two weeks, mm-hmm. and I've had a really good time with it. Yeah, same. Um, which kind of makes this episode feel a bit more like a reward and a celebration, which is what it was meant to be. I think of Power of the Doctor, and I may have mentioned this before, as a old jumper. Okay. If you pull one thread, boy, does it start to fall apart. Oh, God. But why would you want to? Because the jumper's so goddamn warm and comfy. Oh. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's a really fun movie. It's a really fun special. Mm. Um, does it have its faults? Yes. And for once, let's start with the cons. Because there's not too many, but they are there. Tegan and Ace's inclusion is ultimately pointless. Yeah. But I'm grateful for them being here. So I can overlook it. It also sets up the notion that Unit is back, it's doing its thing, and Kate Lethbridge-Stewart has made a point of, hey, let's enlist experts. It ain't just the Doctor anymore. There are lots of people around who have travelled with or or been involved with Adventures of the Doctors who have unique perspectives. Let's maybe get them on board Mm. as consultants. So, as as far as expanding the Hooniverse... I love that they're in it, but ultimately, it's pointless. Now, they are also there because the Master is trolling them. Yeah, but why? Because he just wants to just be a, a dickhead to, like, two former companions of the Doctor and pull them into it. Woman, what is wrong with you? The cat has just jumped off a chair Causing and knocked as much it over, chaos as switched possible. Joy-Cons and all sorts. Who's the Master? Shh, come here, Luna, come on. Make a choice, woman. Shh, 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 lady, come here, come on. Um, other cons... Uh, despite what I said in the Legend of the Sea Devils video about the Yaz Docs thing not quite paying off, I think, the way they're hoping, or indeed feeling, like, earned in show, mm. I hate the fact Yaz leaves just because the vibe between them both seems to be, well, I guess you leave now, because I'm dying. It's like, since when has that ever happened? Like, when has that ever happened? <sighs> exactly. Um, yeah. like it's so weird. Um, God, what else? Uh, I think that's kind of it off the top of my head. Mm. I, I do think it oh, was quite oh, long. Yeah, it, it could it could survive losing like one subplot. Like it does a bit of a flux, and it's like here's all these things, but I think the easiest one to drop would be the Ace and Tegan inclusion. But again, that gives us some very lovely moments that make me feel warm and fuzzy, so I don't mind. Yeah. It's also telegraphing itself from the beginning. Like, at the time, this is a centenary BBC celebration, but it's also the Doctor's last story, and these are always a bit of a blockbuster, so we're just going to have fun. The stakes will be high, and we're going to have a gay old time, right? So you kind of don't mind it to a point, right? Yeah. But, um, well, there's no but. It's just, it's just nice. Um, I, I've not written any cons in my notes. Should we crack on? Sure. Start with, with your notes, notes baby. Must I stroke this cat? Ooh. Le chat. Uh, I love the Gallifrey and Cybermen. You really dig the time, they, they the, uh, the Cybermasters. So, they look so cool. I love the fact that they have a cyber leader with a gold headdress. Yeah. Oh, sorry, cyber controller with a gold headdress. The cyber leader has a black headdress. Yeah. Those two retain the robes. And then the rest the of them case. now just look like Cybermen, but with like Gallifrey and Insignia like burned into their armour. Do you know what I'd say if I saw one with either the leader or the um controller? Go on. That is a beautiful gip. <laughs> That's what I'd say to them. I little, just think the design little, looks really Well really shout out to Joseph Williamson then. <laughs> um <laughs> When the Doctor, Dan, and Yaz are 
trying to get onto the train, they put on this their spacesuits, which is how well, they get mileage. They're getting mileage out of them in eighteen years, isn't they? Um, and they're going down a ladder, which gave me anxiety because I don't like ladders. But those. Well, Dan, did say like, could you not find? Could you not find? Could you not find a less rickety ladder or whatever yeah, it was? Yeah, a more sturdy ladder or something because yeah. it was like a rope it's ladder. Just a rope ladder. Yeah. <laughs> Scary. Um, the train then, sequence is fun. Very, very fun. Uh, when they land on the train, the doctor's like, uh, 9.9 landing, guys. <laughs> it's really cute. It's really, really cute. Um, and of course, that's uh, one of the moments, well, the moment, I suppose, that made Dan want to leave. His helmet gets cracked. And you can the way John Bishop plays that is brilliant. Like, and, it, and it's... Yeah, the, the whole when they get into the train and he's just kind of there with his own thoughts for a minute. Yeah. And you can see everything going through his head of like, I nearly just died. What am I what am I doing? Yeah. Like it really hit him. Um and his exit I don't hate. No. Like it's it's sad that it's at the beginning of a story, but I think it would have been weird to like fold him over into the rest of the episode and then have him go, oh, it's a bit dangerous, I've got to go now. Yeah, like halfway through. Because it almost seemed like he's abandoning his friend when they're about to die. Mm, yeah. Um, and again, the episode does deal with the themes of like people the Doctor has either left behind or who feel left behind or who leave and then kind of like Miss feel resentment almost because they're like, wait a minute, I saw all this incredible stuff and now I've just got to go back to normal. Yeah. which is told through Tegan, for example. Like, Tegan chose to leave for the same reason Dan did. Yeah. Like, it's not fun anymore. Like, yeah. you know, the, the seriousness really hits her. And here she is, bitter as hell that the Doctor's never come to say hello yeah. because a part of her does kind of, like, feel like something's missing. We learn, without learning the specifics... The, the reason Ace and the Seventh Doctor stopped travelling together is because they fell out. They fell out. Sad. And we don't learn the specifics here. And even after this, in some of it, we'll probably do a bonus video of in the future, the um, Tales of the TARDIS shorts. We, we find out a tiny bit more, but even then not the specifics. And I think that's on purpose. It's so that it's like, look, it's up to you, the viewer, why they fell out. Yeah, because she was... Was she supposed to be a teenager? Yeah, she's she's in her, like very late teens. Yeah, so it's like she's she's a rebel. She they they must have disagreed on something, and she. Went... I mean, also like he put her through some really weird stuff. Yeah. Well, like that in the nineties in the wilderness years, that gets fleshed out into him preparing her to become a time lord. Hey. Not a Gallifreyan, but a time lord. And it plays into the whole, like, Cartwell Master Plan stuff of, like, where it would have gone with how he's changing Time Lord civilization and, like, trying to better it. So there's a whole thing of, like... What? Yeah, kind of, like, trying to get rid of the pomposity and the and the, the, the bureaucratic sort of, like, parasitic stuff that's there and everything. And, like, Ace was essentially going to be the first sort of, like, look, this person is amazing. She should be here. She should be, like, shaping how you run things. And change it for the better. What's that from? There's the books in the nineties and stuff. Oh, I see. Now, obviously, none of that's canon. It was for everybody growing up because it was all they had. Yeah. But like the show's decided to change that now, but maybe a version of that did happen. That's crazy. And they fell out over it. Like we'll never know. And I kind of like that they leave it open because it's like that's ah, up to you. Like you can go with that. You can go with the big finish version of their story. You can go with whichever one you want. Just know that she's all right, and they fell out. Um, Professor. Again, that subplot could be cut easily, but the fact the Master uses Tegan and Ace doing their own thing to bring them in, probably just to mess with their heads because it's an extra little kick for him, is pretty sadistic and very on brand for this Master. It's cool when they, um, they're they there when they bring the Master in and they're, they're like, saying the last time they saw him. Well, so we're, we're, Ace was like, last time I saw you, you were a cat. No, you were part cat as well. A man, 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 man should be allowed to experiment, whatever it is he says. <laughs> um, what was he? he says about Tegan's aunt, uh, Aunt Vanessa. He says, like, how's your Aunt Vanessa? Do you keep her in a little dollhouse? Absolute. Oh. Bitch vibes. 
Um, there's, yeah, I mean, we learn that Tegan has had two husbands and several children who don't call her anymore. Uh, adopted children. Adopted uh, children. Adopted son, she's So no wonder she's got to the point where she's like, no, I'm annoyed. Like, where's the doctor? Like, I'm going to start investigating stuff. That was way more fun. Uh, and then obviously later expanded universe stuff confirms that maybe it's also because it wasn't a husband she wanted. No. So, there we go. You've got to give Nissa some kind of storyline. They don't explain what Ace has been doing, but it sticks along with the A Charitable Earth stuff that the Sarah Jane Adventures alludes to. Yeah. She's clearly running something. And there is a book called At Childhood's End, written by Sophie Aldred. Yeah, I remember that. is a yeah. 13th Doctor and Ace book. Yeah. That, because of her inclusion in this, isn't necessarily canon anymore. Because right. of the 13th Doctor and Ace meeting. Right. Um, but that expands on the notion of, like, a charitable earth and that existing. Um, Tales from the TARDIS kind of sort of subtly retcons it into being, yeah, charitable earth never existed. But do you remember the trailer for yeah. season 26 or whatever? Yeah. Where at the end she is the TARDIS, she goes into the kitchenette of her office, grabs the jacket and leaves. Is implying that that's canon and that's set maybe after this. Also, because she mentions in the Tales of the TARDIS, like, oh, she hung up the jacket a while ago. Mm. And then we see, well, actually, she's hung it up in her office. So she's got it nearby. But she, she must have retrieved it first from here. Yeah. Because it's in the lockbox of supplies. That's true. Um, them facing the Cybermen is inspired purely because... Oh, that's the thing. Each of them have faced the Cybermen, the Daleks, and the Master. Yeah. So they are more than equipped to deal with them. Or at least be prepared sort of for what sort of nasty surprises are in store. I thought um, it was... Sorry. Oh, go on. I was going to say, I thought it was cool that there were um, like compartments under the floor that had weapons. Yeah. I thought that was cool. I like that Kate basically... Store delays for time by volunteering to be converted because she's like, take, you can take the knowledge I've got yeah. and use that. Um, cloning. Is it a lazy excuse to bring back a shard? Yes. Do we accept it? Yes, because oh, so Patrick yeah. Kane, Patrick O'Kane is really good in the role, so it's just nice to see him one more time. And I love that his corpse is used as a Russian doll to transport Cybermen into unit. Yeah. Gross. That's so grim. So gross. Uh, the Daleks have their plungers back. I'm a happy boy. They do. The drills into the Earth are very reminiscent of Dalek Invasion of Earth. Yeah. I'm a happy boy. <laughs> um, the fact that the Daleks and the Cybermen are basically just getting a little something out of this. The Daleks are getting the Earth to use as a playground. And the Cybermen are getting a conversion factory planet. Yeah. All, all as a thank you for helping the Master use some of the energy of both situations to, like, his own end. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Yeah, fair enough. And it's like, how has he managed to come up with that? Well, he does have the Siberium in him. Yeah. Like, he does have yeah. a lot more knowledge now. He's able to, like, scheme on a bigger bigger scale. We had fun, didn't we, trying to figure out the continuity for the Master in this. But him showing up at the very end, post the, the unforced regeneration... Yeah in full Rasputin regalia, yeah. suggests that the seismologist O version of the Master is earlier in the story for him. And then he goes off once freed by a shard to go and do all the Rasputin stuff. I'm so confused by it. Well, he had, he had, he had, a, he had his plan, but we saw him in two different period time periods in the story. Yeah. That wasn't the same Master going, and now I go here and put on a disguise, and now I go here and put on this disguise. The first part of his plan chronologically for him was the present day kidnapping the seismologist's part. Killing them all, doing the research, finding out the weak points for the Dalek plan, getting taken into unit, which helped him plant the Cybermen into unit through the Russian doll. Yeah. A shard helps him escape. He then leaves, goes back in time... To be Rasputin. To be Rasputin, and to maintain it all, sends his TARDIS off to be conversion planetoid where it is just there in a police box form to take the mic, but it's like housing the power unit that like sets everything off. Right, okay. And then he's living in, in the past in, in Russia. Like, right. Yeah. Um, but obviously we see it interweaving because we see the Rasputin stuff first, then we see the modern day stuff for him, and then we see the Rasputin stuff again. 
but it's like, no, the, the, the Rasputin preview at the beginning was just there to establish, oh, we're going to be going here. But not yet. But he's already there. Yeah. Um, Sasha De One is the not-so-secret weapon of this story. He's really scary. He's so good, right? Mm. He's, I think, I, no, screw that. He is my favourite modern master. He's the only one that feels like, you know, Jacoby fleetingly, obviously. Sim and Gomez have a ball. Dewan feels like you are in absolute danger if he's yeah. there. And part of that as well is sort of the fact that when he shows up, he's showing up as part of a plan he's already halfway through. Like, you don't know how screwed you are. Because mm-hmm. he's not given the game away yet. But then when it's close to revealing, he can't help himself. He's so gleeful about it. Mm-hmm. He's kind of, he's the erraticness of Sim when he's the old manic. Meets the pantomime, like, supervillain moustache twirling at Ainley. Mm-hmm. Like, he's sort of, he's both of them. And he does it so well. I was screaming in Yaz's, well... When the 14th Doctor is screaming in Yaz's face. Scary. Really scary. Um, and I don't hate his plan. It's, it's, I mean, if it was just to shame... When I originally watched it, I thought, hang on. If he just wanted to, like, ruin the Doctor's legacy, he could just go around pretending to be the Doctor and doing horrible things to places. Yeah, I guess. But then I guess that wasn't the point. Having now box-setted this... No, he wants... He, He's got a bit of the Doctor inside him. He wants to. He hates that. Yeah. He can't change that. But he can change the Doctor yeah. into him. And I, I, again, on my initial watch, I was like, not sure how this works, but sure, whatever. I kind of get it now. Yeah. The Time Lord used to be able to force regeneration. Um, I mean, I guess Romana could do it easily. She bloody tried on bodies. True. Um, but like the second Doctor gets forced to regenerate into the third... We always, you think of it as an execution, but they did give him the option to be like, right, you can choose, go on, take your pick. And he refuses, so they just do it and leave him as John. Yeah. Um, here, the Master forces the 13th Doctor to regenerate, but as part of the process, like, injects himself into the regeneration. So she changes into him. That is her but looks like him with his memories, his personality. Mm -hmm. His original body is just a lifeless corpse in a cabinet. And that's fine by him because he's he's done this a million times. He's changed bodies and used other people's bodies. So this is just how he's going to go and live now. He'll be the infinitely regenerating doctor, the timeless child, and he'll go on to be a horrid bugger and also kind of a mockery of the master's previous character development. Oh, I'm the doctor now. This is me. I'm even going to dress like the Doctor, look. Hodgepodge of a bunch of different looks. Don't I look like the Doctor, everybody? When he started blowing on um, Pat's recorder, you went, take that out of your mouth, you bastard. <laughs> Absolutely. Don't touch my Doctor, you know what I mean? Yes, Ryan. But the costume was great. It, uh, it's fun. It's it's a fun daft it's mockery insane. and a homage. and Yeah, it's it's a ton of fun. It's chaos, but it's... Yeah. <laughs> Did you want to hear more? Hit me, hit me, hit me. Sorry, we should crack on. But yes, go on. Um, t- going back, the train going through the light tunnel through space looked really cool. Yeah, I doubt it. Really, really cool. Tegan and Ace are badasses, that unit with the Cybermen. Because mm-hmm. uh, they were just like, yep, yeah, full speed ahead, let's just get, let's just attack. Well, um, I, love the, I love the whole fact that they're all looking at these paintings and the slideshow being like, why has this beardy dude been graffitied onto all of these paintings? Oh, and it's only when like, the master, wait, that's what the master looks like now. It's like, yep. Yeah, Apparently, well, no, not yet. That's the creepiest bit. Mm. He doesn't look like that yet in his own timeline yeah. yet. Weird. But he's obviously like gone later on. I'll do this, and he does. Genius. When the, ma- <laughs> the screen painting looks so bad, but in a funny so way. Bad. But like in a funny like way. AI is yeah. awful. And um, when the- <laughs> well, he is an evil villain with no like, no morals or love of actual creativity. So. True. Yeah. Uh, when the master has got the doctor in the chamber um, in Russia, he uh, he says the line "dress for the occasion." Yeah, he doesn't say dress, but he says "dressed for the occasion." Yeah, I always right. dress for the occasion. Hey, I see what you did. You there. massive nerd. 
I love you. Like, rewind two years, probably never would have clocked that one. On Animal Crossing, there is an option to make your own shop. Yeah. A, like, clothes shop, and mine's called Dress for the Occasion. Dress for the Occasion. Yeah, because I thought it was funny. I always dress for the occasion. It's something we quote a lot. It is. Uh, it's and beautiful, and I love it. I love Bonnie M. Love him. The, ra, fa- ra, the fact that they put that in there. Oh my god, was, uh, that was boogie time. And that was, again, it's, uh, some people said, that's really goofy, and I'm like, do you remember him, like, Dancing to Scissor Sisters and stuff. Exactly. Like he's done this before. The, the master's ma- on hinge. The master has a weird fascination with Earth pop culture. He's absolutely like, unhinged. He, he's above Earthlings. But he'll watch the clangers in his cell. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, he's like he's leading us all towards a decimation of the population, but he's still gonna check out Teletubbies. Like he's got a bit of a thing for Earth culture. He can't help it. He's a curious little dude. Um Sideman looking at uh, look, Sideman and Dalek looking at each other. I thought that, that was is, really that funny. That is one of the funniest shots in all of this show. <laughs> it really is. It's so good. <laughs> um, any, oh, sorry, I thought we'd have to talk to more, some more about it. <laughs> um, I missed you too when uh, Tegan's talking to her doctor. Right, should we talk about those scenes? Yeah. So the holo- I love the idea of the hologram. It's the doctor... Probably off the back of Flux being like, might be handy if there's like more than one of me on some occasions. Yeah. And it's also an, ev- an evolution of the like, if you're seeing this, that I'm dead or about to die in like, this, from yeah. series one. Yeah. The idea of an AI hologram that, act, like, you program with like, was it a couple thousand years of like my experiences? So it's basically she's put everything in there and she's done this between Flux and now. Yeah. Just in case. And it pays dividends. Because even with even with the fugitive doctor making a cameo, Joe Martin making a cameo, yeah, that's just so the doc. Cool. That's just the fugitive doctor based off of what Jody knows of her incarnation, mm. like that. She just knows she's a badass. Yeah, so like that's what she, and it's enough to throw off the master and the Daleks and the Sidemen because they're like, wait, who the hell's this? Mm. Um, it just gives us an excuse to have Joe Martin back for a scene as well. Heck yeah. Um, but it also gives us the more, scenes more, more. of the fifth doctor talking to Tegan. Yeah. And the seventh doctor talking to Ace. Yeah. Which are cuties. lovely. Such cuties. We're also given the cheeky little Guardians of the Edge premise. Mm. The idea that in regeneration, there's a point where you cross, and once you've crossed it, that's it. You're the next life. And it's not a thing that happens, it's not a thing that looks like that. That's just how she's interpreting it. Yeah. It's like the edge of a desert, like in the arse end of a US like state somewhere. Yeah, the Telephone of poles and rocks and yeah. everything. And there's just a chasm of nothingness. And if she crosses over into that, she's gone. There's a little bit of a holding on, refusing to regenerate. Yeah. And she's greeted by a few versions of her past self. Mm. Which again, not really. It's just how she's interpreting it. Yeah. And when that sequence first happened on broadcast, because we watched... Well, you've never seen this before. No. I watched this about three weeks after it went out because we were in the States. And we weren't going to be in the night it was on BBC America and we were definitely not as hell going to time our holiday like around it. around a broadcast of Doctor Who. It was that like, one no. that we'd had to put off because of COVID. Yeah, so... You know, I I watched the I watched this. I think it was like we got back. You settled. We unpacked stuff. You went to bed, and I was still kind of awake because I'd slept a lot on the plane. Yeah. And I pulled the bike player and watched it. <laughs> I was like, "Hey, that was great!" Um, and when I first saw this, as soon as it reveals David Bradley reprising the First Doctor, I was like, "Okay, that's cool. I like that. Like another version of herself in her head is going to talk her through this." And then David Bradley turns into Colin Baker, and I was like, "Wait, what?" And then Colin Baker turns into Peter Davison. I'm like, wait, what? And then Peter Davison turns very briefly into Sylvester McCoy. And I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> and then they turn into Paul McGann in full eighth Doctor costume. I'm like, wait, what? Because he likes to be different. <laughs> it's like, sorry, why are you not... I don't do robes. There's always one. <laughs> <laughs> cute. So cute. So we still get a bit, even though it's not a multi-Doctor story, we still get a little bit of the multi-Doctor kind of like... Oh, for fuck's sake. Like, frustration yeah. with each other. Yeah. <laughs> which is really nice. Um, and it's a fun idea. I really like that. And it's also cool because this is kind of... I mean, we... Overall, I think we enjoyed the 80s run. 
we weren't huge fans of all of Peter's era. I think we both really loved Collins, and obviously the second and third series of Sills are absolute bangers. Yeah. But, like, there's definitely been a thing of the 80s who sort of not quite having its due yeah. in the modern era whenever they're sort of tipping the hat to things. So the 50th anniversary gives us physical Tom. The BBC centenary special goes, and, and sort of gives us that. Yeah. Now, apparently Tom was approached, and he just never got back. And that was the same with the Five-ish Doctors reboot. Yeah. He was approached, and he just never got back to them. And based on his interview in the recent Radio Times 60th anniversary issue, he sort of jokingly says he's very contemptuous of other Doctors. And based on like accounts of people who work with him all the time, Big Finish and stuff, he doesn't mean he hates the other actors. That's not what he means. He's being a cheeky scouse, so and so. Tom Baker being what, cheeky. What he what? means, what essentially he's saying is, it's weird to him that there are other doctors. Okay. It doesn't f- quite feel like he doesn't feel like he should be playing out that way, because he is the doctor, and the notion of it just being this thing where a bunch of people in a room are all pretending to be the doctor feels kind of weird to him. Right. Like he still misses, he still wishes. He, re- he said this. He regrets not doing the Five Doctors, um, which is why he did Dimensions in Time. But even then, he's not in the square with everybody else. He's the one trying to warn his other selves in like that mind space at the yeah, beginning. Yeah. But like, yeah, it's it's an. I don't think you'd ever would have gotten Tom. The closest you'll ever get is him playing a maybe future Doctor. In the 50th as the curator. That's like the closest you're ever going to get him doing it. And that's kind of magical because it's that sort of... He's not saying, oh, there's two of us playing this character. That doesn't feel right. It's like, no, Matt Smith's Doctor Who. And maybe I am as well. Do you know what I mean? It's like, okay. So it kind of works there. This is a great way to just go, hey, let's hear it from the boys. Look at them. Here they are. And again, that Doctor Who thing of like, no, let's not de-age him. Screw that. Screw it. Screw it. Wibbly wobbly timey wimey. Vestiges, vestiges, vestiges of her consciousness. They don't have to look like how they looked. No. And it's like, that is, that's good. Um, yeah. Uh, unsung hero of this episode. Mandip Gill. Yeah. She cries a lot. And she's great in this. She's really, really good. And she's, she's doing the heavy lifting in this one. Yeah. Because Jodie's out of commission for a couple of reasons. One, plot wise... Two, Jody was preggers. Oh really? Yes, and she oh, she couldn't quite she How couldn't quite she couldn't quite do as much for health reasons. But she has gone on record to say, and she apparently first before it was sort of a public thing, she told someone at a convention, like a young fan, that she she had a baby on the way or whatever. Um, obviously, like family and friends knew, but the reason being is because she is, as she said this on an interview since she is the only actor to have played the role who actually has who played the role with two hearts. Ah, stop it! Right? Oh, right? That's so cute. Oh. Um, that doesn't mean Jodie's doing a Hartnell or a Troughton and having a holiday mid-story. When she's in it, she's absolutely smashing it. Stop! Um, that's so cute. But, oh. yeah, it's like, okay, that's amazing. Um, but, yeah, Mandip does an incredible job in this. Yaz is fantastic in this story. This is the first one where you go, God, I really do wish we'd had a series of just the two of them so they could showcase her more yeah. as, as a performer. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, no, buy it. Absolutely buy it. She's really proactive. Sad. She's on it. She does what needs to be done. Yeah. Her team up with Vinda is a fun little return. Yeah. Uh, another oh. subplot that could be dropped, but the fact that he's in it is still sweet because, you know. The um, the, sorry, go on. No, 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 go on. I was just going to say the fact that she, you know, she's she's essentially mourning mm. and then thinks to herself, no. And then takes takes on... The master. Takes takes charge. Yeah. And is like talking to the TARDIS, like, you know, we need to get her back. And, and we learn that she's been making notes quietly yeah. on how to pilot it. She's got so, she, so she can't quite do it, but she can do it enough that the TARDIS was like, okay, all right, I see where we're going with this. So cute. And she teams up with uh, Jacob uh, Anderson returning as Vinda. Yeah. Which again just feels more like a, we want to kind of celebrate this era, so let's bring back a character from this era. Yeah. And it's great to see him. Absolutely a subplot that could have been dropped. Yeah. But it also makes sense because it's like, yeah, him and Belle are out there um, with their maybe as now born child, who knows, and Carvin Easter, and they're still like 
do we take jobs on, like doing security stuff, investigation stuff, one of which is this power source was stolen. Yeah. I like the notion of it being a power source that like looks like something that needs protecting so that people try and protect it so it looked like a child. The shame is the child looked bored. Real bored. <laughs> Real. The two seats just look so bored. Um, but maybe she was instructed to be like, you're not, don't be emotional. You can't be emotional. Like, because you're not real. Maybe like, their chameleon circuit was broken. We really need to start wrapping up, really. Sorry. Second to last. Um, oh, yeah, another trope that Chibnall does, which I hate not seeing the goodbye for characters. What do you mean? Where are they? Oh, they've all gone. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, Flux, this, other bits and pieces and stuff. It's just really weird, like, characters not quite saying bye. Revolution of yeah. the Daleks, like... We talked about how um, Moffat is scared of death. Chibnall's scared of goodbye scenes. <laughs> not goodbyes, goodbye scenes. Because yeah. um, she even runs off when Dan leaves. Yeah, she just turns tail and goes back into the TARDIS. Mm. That's a lovely moment, though, between um, Yaz and Dan where they have a big cuddle. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's a bit annoying that they all, they don't all say bye. But, because they would want to, like Ace and Tegan especially would be like, no, I've got yeah. something to say. Yeah. Um, but we do get... Um, the sheer bleeding coincidence, unless the Doctor kind of knew this was going to happen, so dropped Yaz off where she did on purpose. Uh, Graham, who when he returned earlier, you went, oh, Graham! Because you had no yeah, idea that was no. going to happen. I, I remember you saying that Graham was in Oh, it. Brad, oh no, I remember, I, I think I told you, oh, oh, you'll see Bradley Walsh again. But I forgot. Yeah. And then I was like, <gasps> and <laughs> as I was writing notes, Christopher went, are you writing Graham in capitals? And that literally was. <laughs> You know me so well. Graham and Dan, which again, the moment you see them together on screen, you're like, oh my God, what? This makes sense, kind of. Going to what appears to be the first ever meeting of a bunch of people after digging around online and the adventure he's just been through, he's found of all travelled. So we get Kate Stewart. I love that she's at the group as well. I think that's yeah. quite sweet. Like, you know, her dad would be like, no, that's daft. I'd never go to one of those things. Yeah. But maybe later in life he would have done. Yeah. Um... Kate now is just like, no. And as she says, like, oh, by the way, I might be um, recruiting some of you for some freelance yeah, definitely. Uh, services. Definitely, Joe in. Well, Joe Jones, yeah. Joe Bloody Jones, Nee Grant. Um, lovely to see Katie Manning, as always. We still don't know how she's back on Earth, and I guess we'll find out in the, as of this recording, upcoming stories, but Melanie Bush... I thought you meant Joe then, I was like... No, oh. Melanie Bloody Bush, Bonnie Langford. Um, there she is. Weird that she's not sat next to Ace, but sure, whatever. We're just seeing the everyone introducing themselves portion of the meeting, so fine, whatever. Um, uh, and of course, Ace, uh, Sophie Aldred and Tegan, Janet Fielding, and uh, Graham O'Brien, uh, Bradley Walsh and Dan Lewis, and yes. uh, John Bishop and Yasmin Khan, Mandip Gill, and then a face that the moment... They cut to the close-up of him. You made a noise like a puppy that's just seen their owner walking down the driveway toward the front door. You sounded so excited in such a primal way. It was so good. When William Bloody Russell as Ian Chesterton appeared in frame. He was in the first episode. And he's Doctor here. Who, and he's here as of... As of this recording, the but last. also, also just like just the centenary, yeah. a celebration of the BBC's history. Going, shall we get a dude from the first ever episode of this show? This show that has existed for fifty nine years of the hundred year history. Shall we get him in it? I think we should. That was amazing. So cool. Really, really cool. So cool, and I love that he gets the whole like you know I'm gonna miss her. Sorry, did you say her? <laughs> And he's just all like, huh? <laughs> I love it. I love it, I love it, I love it. <clears throat> There's a behind-the-scenes photo somewhere of them filming on that location, and I'm pretty sure they're all wearing those, like, 
<clears throat> those like things you put around your shoes or the plastic oh, things yeah, to keep the, uh, yeah. probably just so they're not scuffing the floor of the location and then taking them off the church the hall but there's just a photo of them all gathered around having a picture and it's just like oh my god it's a group of companions from different decades of the show it's really cute that's great um like if ifs and buts were candy and nuts I know but it would have been cute if like um Martha was there that would have been cute yeah just like sort of one of, one of the modern companion one of the modern era companion who, like, we all would go, if she popped up in a unit story, we'd all go, finally! There she is again! Hello! Um, but, yeah, like... Yeah, it's a bit strange that there isn't anyone... Familiar. Well, they're sort of focusing on kind of... The modern era is the modern era, and the classic era, they sort of focus on the 80s. Yeah. And I think that's fair. You know what I mean? Like, that's, that's, that's fine. Like, the modern era, they're focusing on 2022, Doctor Who. Um... <clears throat> And it's a lovely celebration, which leads us to our last topic before the battery dies. Jodie's good in this. Really good. She's not in it a lot, but when she is, she's great. Her genuine fear at this plan, her disbelief at one of the Daleks going rogue. Yeah. Which feels like a... It's so weird, because it's never kind of fully explained beyond, oh, here's why I've gone rogue. And you're like, okay, but like, how's that happened? It feels like that was an episode they didn't get to do, and they just wanted to use the idea. Um, but like her scenes there her utter horror at what's going on her kind of acceptance of death even when she goes like but I'm not ready like she then kind of makes peace her and Yaz go and get ice cream they just sit on the TARDIS and have basically a date yeah well she doesn't well it it makes you think that she's going to die because of the regeneration reverse generation but then it's actually because the master redirects like the energy from the yeah. the, the power source and it it, and it smacks her square on yeah um sad it is but it's it's you know it's another time the master's killed her the master who himself is dying from the the uh the process um I hope it's not the end for Sasha. I'd love to see him in at least one more. It'd be nice to have a master crossover. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But if that is the end for him, what a way to go out as like the main villain of the last story of that era. Um, they did famously find Rasputin on a planet, random planet. <laughs> yeah, a random planetoid. Um, Hanging out of a tub. Covered in dead cyber factories. <laughs> um, her last scene is lovely because it's... It's very grand looking, but it's a very small moment. Mm. I also love that we finally get a Doctor regeneration outside of the TARDIS. Yeah. Because they've realised, just because we film this in the studio to keep it as secret as possible, doesn't mean we can't film an outside scene in the studio. Yes. <laughs> Let's get her on a cliff face. <laughs> Let's do it. Um, it's known that her last words were actually longer and the tag your it was like in the middle of the 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 page of dialogue and it was the editor Chris Chimmel said this on I think it was Free Radio Scar or the first podcast interview he did after he uh, left his showrunner I think that was the one where he said the scene was longer the editor just basically went just watch this showed them the version they'd cut together and he went no you're right that's better doesn't make sense to have the tag you it anywhere else well it's just like tag you it because you're going to go on to do this and you're going to go on to like do you know what I mean like they're, they're, yeah um, I think it's better the way it is. Jamie Magnus Stone directed this one. He does a phenomenal job. Like the single camera shot of a shard blasting through the basement floor of unit. There's like one camera shot yeah, and everything. Yeah. It's great. There's lots of really cool camera tricks. But this sequence where Ra- um, what's it? Jamie Magnus Stone's direction bleeds into Rachel Talele's direction for the end of the scene. Uh, Rachel Talele returning from having directed a bunch in the Moffat era, late Moffat era. And is the director of at least uh, the first of the 60th anniversary specials. She directed right. the Star Beast. Um, is is really nice. That scene looks fantastic. And there's a whole thing to be said about the 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 change of costume and intent behind why they chose not to have David in in Jodie's cosy. But like, because there's a whole thing with that. I think it would have been fine. But I get it. It adds to the mystery because for the first time yeah. since Hartnell into Troughton the Doctor's clothes change. Yeah. And the Doctor looks at it as like, wait, what? Yeah. It's one of the what's. Like, <laughs> um, 
there were people who on the night, the news had come out that David and Catherine were coming back for some anniversary specials. Mm. The news had also come out that Shooter Gatwa was going to be the next Doctor. Mm -hmm. So the sort of belief was, oh, they're going to do like a bonus um, 10th Doctor and Donna story. Oh, his costume's a bit different from those pics we've seen, but oh, okay, cool, all right. Don't think everybody knew that Jodie was going to turn into David. No. So it was a big shock for a lot of people. It's good that it was a surprise. It's played very nicely. Jodie's last moment is just adorable. Um, I'm going to miss her. I, I sort of like, you know, other companions and writers crossing over and this, that, the other. I think I would have just loved to have seen Jodie written by someone else. I don't hate Chibnall as a writer. I just don't really agree or enjoy... A agree with or enjoy a lot of elements of his era. Yeah. And I do believe that there are more dud stories than good yeah. to good to great ones. Yeah. But when he and the writers he works with hit it out of the park, they hit it out of the park. Yeah. And I don't think any of it comes from a place of, you know, oh, that'll do, just send that draft in. I don't think any of it, do you know what I mean? It's up and sea devils. Well, <laughs> but like, I don't hate this era overall, but it does kind of sit in my head with like the early Davison, early Capaldi, like, yeah. I'm only really watching that if we're box setting. Yeah. Or if I'm going, go or if I'm going like, hey, let's do like a one one story from each Doctor kind of thing. Yeah. I'm only really going to possibly revisit some of these stories if I'm doing that. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Um. Same with you? Say, same. Um, but I still have that feeling of I don't dislike any of the Doctors. <laughs> yeah. I love every single person that's played the Doctor. Um, I had some pre, um, pre-emotions watching it before watching this era, um, thinking that, you know, cause, just because of what I'd seen, mm. it was all going to be crap. Um, but having watched it all, I, I actually loved uh, like I ended up loving Yaz mm -hmm. obviously I love Graham because obviously um, and you know I loved Dan yeah he was really really cute even though he's not in it long um, and love 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 Jodie I want to yeah. I want to hold her I'm not massive on the 13th Doctor but that's not because of Jodie like I just like the like the twelfth, like the fifth is just a lot where I'm like, eh, yeah, okay, whatever. I think she's erratic and chaotic and silly and scary and it's like I, I love that. That's great. She she is absolutely one of the best ambassadors the show's ever had. I mean in, it, in, in terms of like how she talked about it, how she like handled the responsibility of having that role within kind of culture and especially for the young audiences. Mm. She, she's she one of the best. In lockdown. That, that is, I, I'd say that with no sense of irony. That short, written by Chibnall and shot by Jodie, during early COVID and the first first few months of the lockdowns, where she was, it's basically just a message to kids, is one of the best bits of Doctor Who media. Yeah. And I'm not saying that to be ironic or even hyperbolic. It is. Yeah. Because the world had gone to shit People were confused as hell. No, like, no less were the kids confused as hell by it all. And the doctor left them a video message. And it's so well performed by, by Jody. Yeah. And Chibnall nailed it. And apparently it was just the two of them chatted about it. He wrote it. They spoke about it a bit. He tweaked it. And then she shot it and sent it to him. And it went out on all the socials. And it's great. Yeah, it's really good. She's been an incredible ambassador for the show. And I hope that regardless of how you feel about the era, uh, or even her doctor, I hope that time is kind and acknowledges that for Jodie the same way it finally is for, like, Colin, Sylvester, Paul, like, yeah. people, uh, you know, people go, oh, no, it's great, honestly, these bits are brilliant, these bits, and yeah, this was a bad call, and this was it, but this is great, and they're really good, and, and I'm hoping that Jodie doesn't have to wait as long as they did yeah. for people to... Give her a props, because this era gave us a lot of cool stuff as well. You know what I mean? Give us Joe Martin. Jadoons with a Mohawk. Yeah. Uh, the design and performance of Swarm and Azure. 
some really fun historicals. Um, it gave us Bradley Bloody Walsh oh. as a companion instead of an evil clown in a spin-off. One absolute like, you know, it gave us Sega and Aquinola's music. Yeah. You know, it gave us Chibnall's love for female unsung figures of history. Absolutely. Being at the forefront of stories. Um, it gave us Dewan's master. Yeah. It gave us not a favourite TARDIS interior, but a freaking bold one. Yeah. Like, they went for it. Made they they went for it. Made Fair me think enough. Of coral. <clears throat> hmm? Made me think of Coral. Well, that's just the ninth and tenth doctor, isn't it? But also, why was it leaking goo? We will never know. The flux disrupted it allegedly. Anywho, what was it? <gasps> um, Power of the Doctor. We like it. Diddle it, diddy. Do you like it? Let us know down in the comments down below. Uh, in terms of our recordings, we're going to be taking a bit of a break. Um, in fact, I've been thinking about it. I'll say this to you live in the recording. Uh, we're going to be watching the 60th specials as they go out. I, oh, are we now? Yes, they are. Yes, we are. Because we're recording this on the 24th of November 2023. I think what we should do is a bit later in the year, or maybe even in January, we'll record our videos for the three specials and the Christmas special. Okay. <clears throat> I think we'll probably do a little bonus about Tales of the TARDIS as well. Just a little chinwag about those. Um, and then uh, we'll be calling it we'll be calling it a day. We will. Um, <clears throat> will we ever cover series one of the new era, whatever name it gets given, onwards? Mm. Yeah, maybe. Maybe in like, do you know what we should do? When Shooty's called it a day, we'll do Shooty's series. We just kind of we just kind of want to enjoy it as it is. Yeah, yeah. So like like like, and we've enjoyed Instead this. Of like analyzing, but obviously really. there's been that commitment thing to it of time in it. I think what we'll do is like say Shooty did three series. After the three series are done, we'll rewatch the three series and we'll do our videos on them. Okay. So like a few years down the line, but we will do we will do ones for the specials and um, uh, <laughs> the totally secret but not at all spoiled title thanks to Disney Plus, The Church on Ruby Road. Uh, we will we'll do those in the new year, so you'll be seeing them with your with your scheduled programming. Yeah. So basically, what I'm saying is, expect like five, six videos more after this in total before this series goes to bed. Uh, until the end of shooties era, then we'll then we'll do a look back. Um, yeah. If we're both alive, and if we're not, one will puppeteer the other. Oh, um, okay. Ooh, morbid. Anyway, just give Luna a little tickle on the head. You can't see Minnie, but she's down here. Good night from them. Uh, good night from Mrs. Chris. <laughs> 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 um, bye, everyone. <laughs>